Welcome to our webinar, Debriefing After Cardiac Arrest, a Roadmap to Improve Outcomes Utilizing Quantitative Data. My name is Janet Poe, your host for this webinar today, which is presented by Dr. Heather Wolf, Assistant Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Director of Quality Improvement for Critical Care Medicine. In this presentation, Dr. Wolf will take us through a new approach to debriefing by incorporating quantitative data. She will show us the clinical importance of conducting a high quality cold debriefing program and provide real world advice for implementing such a program in your hospital to help you overcome specific challenges you may encounter. Now, before we begin, just a few housekeeping details. After the presentation, we should have time for a Q&A session. So during the presentation, simply type in your question and send it to me using the questions box in the control panel, usually on the right side of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, Dr. Wolf will address as many questions as time allows. And with that, I will now turn over the presentation to Dr. Heather Wolf. Good afternoon and morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, today virtually to um, talk to everybody about um, quantitative debriefing after cardiac arrest. Um, I think that this has been something that um, I've been working on uh, for the past um, 10 years in our children's hospital, but certainly um, it's something that's used um, throughout um, pediatrics and adults, and uh, we'll go over some of the evidence today, um, but then also some of some real life sort of how to, how to get these programs started. Um, so first, just to get everybody on the same page, um, what is debriefing? Um, so one of the classic definitions of debriefing is a facilitator-led participant discussion of events with reflection and assimilation of activities. Um, it, this is, you know, most classically done um, in um, sports. So uh, quarterbacks every day will look at the tape and look at what they did. They'll go over it with their coach and they'll improve their performance for the next time. Um, debriefing is also performed in aviation and has recently been um, picking up steam in healthcare and is now actually recommended by the American Heart Association um, to have a debriefing program as a part of the comprehensive care of cardiac arrest patients. Um, we still have a lot to learn about the structure, um, attendance, and content in these sessions and how they can um, help improve uh, outcomes. Um, but the, to get started, we just need to start doing them, I think. Um, so there's a few de debriefing types also that we want to talk about. So a cardiac arrest happens, um, and hot debriefs can happen right away. And I think that this is probably what most people are familiar with. These are debriefings that happen minutes to hours um, after an event um, tend to be less, oops, that slide went fast. Uh, sorry, team. Um, a little bit less data driven, a little more reactionary, um, involves the actual team members that were at the code and is used to really identify issues that came up. Hopefully you can identify some good um, quality improvement or patient safety issues um, to be fixed for the next event. These are really important, but a little bit different than what we're going to be talking about today. Um, cold debriefing, on the other hand, is actually happened sort of days to weeks after an event um, and really is focused on the data about what happened and what the outcomes were. Um, it we like to say that we debrief the environment, meaning it's not just the team that was there present in the um, arrest, but um, for us, it's any nurse, any physician, um, any respiratory therapist that works in our environment that can learn from that event to hopefully then Im improve their um, future um, future performance. Um, we certainly use information that was um, discovered in the hot debriefing during a cold debriefing, um, but we really think it's important to sort of involve everyone because at least for us in pediatrics, um, these events are actually fairly rare, so we only will have a cardiac arrest event, uh, you know, at most once a week, uh, which means that any number of our physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists aren't actually getting as exposed to these as we might imagine. Um, so we do have some evidence that um, cold debriefing um, can improve CPR quality. So this was a study that we did um, at our institution, 
And um, we saw um, after uh, about two years, with the, within about two years after um, implementing this program, uh, that we had improvements in our chest compression depth, our chest compression rate, our CPR fraction. And when you look at sort of an overall um, metric called excellent CPR, this almost doubled in the years after initiating our cold debriefing program. Um, and with that, uh, we saw improvement um, in survival to discharge with good neurologic outcomes. We went from 29% to almost 50% of our um, patients that were getting CPR in our ICU um, surviving um, with good neurological outcomes, so walking and talking and, and hopefully going back to school. Um, there's some, also some evidence in adults that this can help. So uh, Dean Edelson really started a lot of this work in Chicago, um, and they found in their program that um, integrated debriefings improved uh, not only their chest compression metrics, but also improved return of spontaneous circulation in their patients. Um, so what is interdisciplinary resuscitation debriefing? So in our institution, um, and there are many ways to do this, but we hold these monthly. Uh, we involve physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, surgeons. Um, we like to involve, um, invite pretty much anyone that might uh, be involved in the care of a patient. Uh, we talk about the quality of resuscitation that was provided during that arrest. Um, that, improved, that involves waveforms. Um, we talk about examples of excellence, um, clinical issues, system issues, and team performance. We focus on patient physiology a lot and what was different about that. Um, and what we saw is that in the beginning, uh, we were saying events like this. So a patient develops ventricular fibrillation, they lose their art line waveform, which is this um, right in here. You see they no longer have a pulse with that. Um, and in the beginning, we were seeing events where this might have gone on for two minutes without CPR. People were not recognizing deterioration in our patients. Um, luckily, well, I can tell you that doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, so what do we do? So we start um, with whatever data that we can find. So lab and radiology data uh, for the time period up before the arrest, um, including um, anything that was done during the arrest. Um, any CPR quality report that you can get from your defibrillator uh, can be really important to feed that data back um, to your team. Um, so we use um, sort of pictures like this where we show people the chest compression fraction, uh, the depth, the rate, um, so CPR quality that they actually gave to that patient during that arrest. Um, there's a summary slide at the end that sort of um, gives a big picture overview. Um, we talk about the patient outcome. Um, we include active participation, which isn't a problem in our institution. People are, are more than happy to participate. Um, and I think one of the important things to know is that this is a protected under MCARE, under sort of the, under the clinical quality improvement work that we do in the PICU. Um, we rely on consultants, so if it was a patient with pulmonary hypertension, we'll ask some of our specialists to come um, to talk about what uh, could be unique to those situations. Um, so we're going to go through a few slides, and then at the end, if we have time, which I suspect we will, we'll actually go through an example debriefing to give you a little bit more of an idea um, of what uh, sort of the flow of a full debriefing would look like. But we start just with an introduction to debriefing, um, especially if you're starting a program anew. Um, people may have never um, participated in a debriefing before. People might be nervous about coming to them, especially if they were participated in the care of the patient. Um, so you wanna get everyone on the same page. So um, these are multidisciplinary reviews. We tell people that they rely on active participation. If I just sat there and talked at them for an hour, um, people probably won't learn. And we talk about how it relies on everyone um, to learn from significant events in the PICU. Uh, with the caveat, um, with this note below, that we'll discuss events prior to the patient's decompensation as they impact the resuscitation, but we focus our discussion on the actual resuscitation effort. So um, different than an m, m where you might be looking at what were the events that led to the deterioration, 
for us, for our clinical event debriefings, we want to focus on what happened during the resuscitation. We have a separate um, uh, process that really focuses on the sort of preventing deterioration work. Um, and I find that if you don't put this caveat in, people can spend a lot of time talking about um, what we could have done to prevent the arrest, which is really very important, um, but you can lose the focus on um, talking about high quality CPR and the things that happen during the arrest that can improve patient outcomes. Uh, we have ground rules for every, every arrest, and the second slide is really um, geared to create psychological safety within the group. Um, so uh, we're here to learn from one another in a safe and respectful environment. And this is our basic assumption that we use, um, excuse me, in um, simulation throughout our hospital. So this is a familiar sentence to people that we believe everyone who participated in the resuscitation is intelligent, well-trained, cares about doing their best, and wants to improve. Um, and I wanna just take a moment to talk about, so the, the purpose of the ground rules in these introduction slides is really creating psychological safety among the group. Um, I'm gonna take a, a minute just to talk about psychological safety because I think it is probably one of the most important things that a group needs to have um, to really learn from um, and have sort of a positive experience with debriefing. Um, so psychological safety is really a shared belief held by members of a team um, that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. In psychologically safe teams, team members feel accepted and respected and comfortable speaking up without fear of retribution. Um, Amy Edmondson does a lot of really interesting work from Harvard about psychological safety, and I would encourage everybody to read her books because they're fantastic. And really what she talks about is she talks about these sort of grids where you have psychological safety here, and then sort of what is, how demanding is a task. If something is easy, um, and you don't have a lot of psychological safety about it, you're sort of apathetic toward that thing. You don't care that much about it. Um, and if it's easy and you have a lot of psychological safety driving your car, for instance, um, that's a comfort zone. You can do that in, on autopilot almost. Um, however, though, as tasks get more demanding, you can enter this anxiety zone if you don't have psychological safety, meaning that you're trying to process things, your brain is working in overdrive, and if you're not feeling safe, what is gonna happen is you're gonna get develop a lot of anxiety and not learn. And the goal really is to be in this learning zone um, where you have psychological safety, you can take risks, you can ask questions about things you don't know um, or bring up things that may have not gone right in that arrest um, without the sort of fear of retribution for that team. Um, so the goal is to stay in the learning zone during these debriefings. Um, and we'll talk later. That doesn't mean that you don't discuss things that went wrong and you don't discuss ways that people can improve. But the, the goal really is to do those things in a way uh, where the whole team can learn something and move forward from an event. Um, and I thought this was a really great sort of statement that drew all this together, but healthcare professionals take psychological risks when they allow their performance to be watched and analyzed by peers and instructors. So developing and maintaining a psychologically safe environment is important uh, for people to be able to um, learn and grow. So that's all. I could talk about this all day. Um, feel free uh, to, to catch me later about this. Um, so during our debriefings, we keep our providers anonymous. We don't call people out. Um, about who was in the event or who was leading an event, but often people will self-identify, and we let them do that, um, but we certainly would never call them out. Um, and when you talk about debriefing, um, the facilitator of the debriefing is going to lead the team through the discussion, um, but the person has to be fairly um, adept at managing the room. So depending on the audience, um, and the participants, there's a wide variety of experience and comfort with resuscitation uh, from, you know, it's July, so there's first day interns who've never been in a code before, to very experienced senior attendings who have been through 100 or 200 codes or 1,000 codes in their life. Um, so you have to sort of manage um, all of those um, levels of experience and comfort, um, along with people who may not believe in the process, um, may not uh, sort of think that they know it all and have all of the answers. Um, there's people that just don't engage. Um, 
and I think the most common thing that happens is people who sort of are the perfectionist and they just talk over and over again about, you know, what they could have done differently. Um, and that's not really the point of a debriefing. So you sort of have to be able to steer people away from these conversations um, and be pretty comfortable. You know, oftentimes the people who start these programs and run these programs tend to be junior. So you have to pick someone who's going to be willing to sort of tell their boss that uh, that's an interesting point, but we're going to have to move on now. Um, which comes over time. Uh, but really, I think what we spend a lot of time in debriefings doing is finding the good in every event. So the majority of codes and emergency events that happen have a lot that went right. Um, I found that focusing on what went well really reinforces that behavior for the rest of the room. So if the team was doing a really good job with switches and counting down um, and having really short switch times, sort of talking in the room about, well, what were you doing that would enabled you to have really low, um, no flow time between switches? And it may be that they were counting, it might be how they set the room up, um, but sort of talking through that with people that weren't there can help them then for the next code um, do that behavior well as, um, as well. Um, and then you have to address the difficulties that came. So, um, there's a lot that went well, and there's a lot of positive things that you'll talk about, but the only way to get better is uh, to talk about things that didn't go well. Uh, the things that we find, um, at least in our institution, that we have troubles with um, is rhythm analysis. Uh, we forget sometimes to look back because PEA and um, is so common in our population in asystole that we sometimes forget to look for ventricular fibrillation. Uh, we also have a lot of cognitive biases. We know some of these patients well. You think you know what's going on and maybe something else is happening or delay in shock or delay in starting CPR was certainly something that we saw um, in the beginning of this. Um, so rather than sort of being hypercritical and saying, well, there was a two minute pause and this was terrible and this patient died because of this, you know, the way we would approach this is to say, um, there was a prolonged downtime uh, prior to the start of CPR. So let's discuss what led to that and how we can prevent it from happening in the future. Um, and for, uh, for example, sort of a recent um, scenario was a nurse that just thought that there was something wrong with the arterial line. And that is why, um, so she was she spent some time troubleshooting the arterial line before calling the code. So we were able to sort of talk to everyone in the room about, um, you know, using all of your vital signs. If it's not, if it's the art line's not working, look at your pulse ox, look at your heart rate, look at a, uh, sort of all of the data you have. Um, and then sometimes things happen in codes that are really, really bad. So either there was a serious safety event that happened that led to the code, or there was just something that happened during the code um, that was very traumatic or, um, or actual medical errors were, um, happen during the code. This is not very often um, and can be challenging in front of a whole group. So the way that we've addressed this in the past is we just sort of discuss these problems with the parties that were involved offline and find out if they're comfortable presenting this to the group. Oftentimes they will be. There's only been once in my entire sort of experience with debriefing in the last 10 years that someone said, no, this is just not the right event to debrief. Um, we sort of pick one event and debrief it every month. So there's always other things to choose from. And then we sort of let our um, medical error process um, take over. So we'll have our ACA group come in and work up for, on this code rather than do a debriefing on this. Um, so there are the biggest um, issues that come up as barriers for debriefing um, are fairly consistent throughout most institutions that I've talked to about this. So with hot debriefing, the barriers tend to be finding time within the hours of the event. So I found talking to people that this is sometimes easier in emergency departments where um, patients come in, they have their event, and either they leave to go to an ICU or the operating room or they stay or they have passed away. So there's sort of this natural downtime that ends at the end of every event where teams can come together. Um, it doesn't always happen in the ICU. So oftentimes if the patient survives, the team is really busy taking care of the patient. Oh, excuse me. Um, and um, it's hard to find time before the end of your shift to talk 
Um, for hot debris readings, we don't have data um, available immediately. Um, so people sometimes are hesitant to talk about what happened because their memories just aren't that great. Um, for cold debriefing, the barriers are similar. Um, time tends to be the biggest barrier for everyone. Um, it's hard to find a time that works for everyone in a group. Um, and it's hard for people that attended the event to actually attend the cold debriefing, say if it were a night shift nurse that can't come to the daytime. There are ways, of course, to work around this, um, which we'll talk about sort of later in the, um, in the talk. Uh, so how do you start a program? So if you think that, you know, debriefing may be the thing that you're missing that may help sort of kick your quality of CPR and outcomes up in your institution, um, these are the, this is where sort of we started um, and have moved along the way. So certainly discussing with your um, team leadership, with your um, institutional leadership um, to make sure you have support for them. Um, and unfortunately, I think one of the most important steps is actually discussing this with the lawyers within your institution. Every institution that I've worked with has had some different caveats about how they would want something like this to proceed. But what you want to make sure is that your uh, discussions are imp care protected so that nothing that is said in these events can ever be sort of um, looked at from a legal standpoint down the road. Um, Find a time that the most can attend. There's never going to be a time where everyone can attend. Uh, and I've also always found that if you're able to feed the people that come to the meeting, they're more likely to come. Um, and then after that, having a follow-up plan. So nothing is going to discourage a team more than if you're constantly identifying system issues in cold or hot debriefings and don't or can't fix them within your institution. So finding a way to incorporate your debriefing programs into your CQI practices within your division or within your hospital is really important um, in order to sort of keep the momentum up with these programs. Uh, the other thing that we have been able to do that's been very successful for us um, at maintaining physician attendance is offering MOC points. Um, so maintenance of certification is something that um, the type four points around quality improvement projects is challenging for many physicians to get. Um, these programs where you're looking, um, you're measuring data, you are presenting that data back to a group with plans to improve future practice are sort of perfect for these MOC programs um, and can really benefit your whole group and get them to buy into your improvement process around um, cardiac arrest and CPR quality. And then I get a lot of can'ts. So, um, you know, this is the reason that we can't do this in our institution. Um, I'm sure you've all heard some um, or, or had some that have come up for you. Um, so one of the most common ones is people being afraid that they're gonna get in trouble for poor performance. So say they have a run of code and there's really poor quality CPR and the patient doesn't do well. Uh, they don't want that to be reviewed because they don't want to get in trouble for it. So, you know, a few things I would say about that is one, people should never be, um, so using this sort of quality data, um, the goal is to have it um, be used for future improvement and not for punishment. Um, this often can reflect a culture problem within, within the institution itself. Um, and maybe you need to take a step back and, and really sort of um, change the focus around the program um, and really sort of have people feel more comfortable with it. Um, put the goal back on the patient and the outcome. Um, really, we're not trying to measure or punish people. Um, this is really about improving care for patients. Um, and then really focus on what the team is doing well. There's a lot out there that the team is doing well. Choose one element and um, to prove on and focus energy there. If people know what's expected of them then they often will improve their performance. Uh, no one has the time for this, which is, is true. We all are busy. There's a lot of competing priorities. Um, but I think we have enough evidence now that says that delivering high quality CPR within the hospital can improve outcomes for patients. So I think that this should be um, at the top of everyone's list of things that they would want to improve. Um, if there's a way how you can sort of figure out how to incorporate debriefing, cold debriefing or hot debriefing into um, your 
code committee, your review process. There's there has to be some process in every ho hospital um, for reviewing codes, especially codes that occur at the ICU. So if you can't um, come up with a time where you're spending a whole hour with a group um, doing a debriefing, um, how can you incorporate this into other workflow? So maybe you can display your CPR data within an M&M, or maybe you can come up with a way that at your code committee review meetings that you're actually looking at the data um, that can come out of your defibrillator, which is just such useful information, um, rather than just letting that all sit um, in the machine and go unseen. Um, or maybe you have a, an educational case conference that this can be worked into. Um, anywhere that you can get this data sort of in front of people so that they can see how they're doing and hopefully improve later. Um, so that's sort of the setup to everything. Um, what I have in the next few slides um, are an example code review that we did in our institution. Um, it has been de-identified and uh, I changed some of the events so it can't be traced back really to any of our patients. Um, so we're gonna go through this and then I think we'll have ample time really uh, at the end of the call for uh, lots of questions and answers. Um, so we've seen this slide before. This is our ground rules that we start with. Uh, this is the outline. So we talk very briefly about pre-arrest case presentation. We do a review of the arrest and then the post-arrest course. So uh, this case started when the, the a code was called um, uh, in our within our ICU complex. Um, the patient was a three-year-old who had multiple chronic medical problems. Um, she had chronic respiratory failure, a tracheostomy and a ventilator, and was hospitalized with worsening lung disease and developed new subcutaneous emphysema within the last 24 hours. Um, the nurse called the team when she noted uh, bradycardia, bradycardia pal pallor, and she became unresponsive and activated a code. Uh, chest compressions were underway when the code team arrived, which was great. Um, she initially had a rhythm that was bradycardia with poor perfusion that progressed then to PEA and asystole. Um, so, in this, so this is really all the data we give, um, sort of going into a code. We really want to sort of get into it um, and see what the team is thinking. So, um, this uh, I should also say I haven't mentioned this at this point. Um, the people who lead our code reviews, um, our cardiac arrest debriefings, are fellows. Um, so it's a great educational opportunity for them to um, think through this, but then also sort of teach uh, their co-fellows um, about the code process. So uh, our, we did have a fellow that was leading this event, and we were able to sort of say, well, what was your thought process? So um, at this point, we would pull up the PEA asystole algorithm, um, go over that with the team, because remember that you have brand new learners, some brand new nurses, think it's July, and there's some first day fellows and first day residents who maybe have taken PALS or ACLS, you know, within the last year, but maybe forget some of this stuff. Um, so we want to really go through and say, well, this is the algorithm, this is what we would expect to do in this case. Um, what were you specifically thinking? So. We really wanted to make sure we were doing good high quality CPR, so they assigned a CPR coach just to focus on the defibrillator and the feedback and making sure we were good doing good CPR. The biggest next thing we thought about was reversible causes, so H and T, so reading this aloud, um, which is what they did during the code, which was really helpful. Um, one of the team members actually was able to run out of the room also and just look back at the monitor to see if anything had changed right before. Um, they gave some volume, they hand ventilated with 100% oxygen, attempted to draw blood, which of course the PICC line wouldn't draw, um, obtained a D-stick, the patient had a normal temperature. Because of the subcutaneous emphysema, they decided to do bilateral needle decompressions, um, and the team had planned to do a bedside cardiac ultrasound. Um, when you look back at the rhythm, so this is where the, the data will start to play in. So, um, because this is a week or two later, we have some time to go back and we can pull the data from our monitors and we can pull the data from our defibrillators and 
actually look at what happened and sort of walk the team through in a way that in the moment they were there was no way that they could have seen this or learned from it in the same way. So there was sort of a sudden change in her rhythm in the minutes before uh, this arrest happened. Um, and then you can see with her pulse ox going flat um, that she progressed to um, PA and asystole. And then you can see within the um, chart, this sort of all of this artifact and then this respiratory pleth is now the start of CPR. And you can start to see her pulse ox coming back with CPR. So even if you aren't at the point where you're able to reliably get the data out of your ZOL, uh, or whatever defibrillator that you're using, um, I would one, encourage you to figure out a system to do that in your hospital, but just also know that data is all around you. Um, and more and more, you're able to get this data later down the road to review it. So what we say with our team is that, you know, if your pulse ox tracing is coming back during CPR and you don't have any other way to look at quality, that is probably pretty good. If you have a flat pulse ox during CPR, um, maybe you wanna look at other ways. It's not perfect, but it's something. Um, so we talk a lot about our code timeline. It's sort of helpful to get everyone understanding what the event looked like. The bradycardia started, the code was called a few minutes later. We may talk about what happened in that few minutes, what troubleshooting they were doing at the bedside before calling, um, you know, how many doses of epinephrine we were giving, uh, did we uh, delay um, needle decompression too long, sort of what are the things that we feel like that we could have done. In this case, we found hyperkalemia, and once we treated hyperkalemia, then um, the patient had return of time spontaneous circulation. Um, this is everybody's favorite picture. We do this um, for every code where we, right after the arrest, we'll have the team sort of just jot down where everyone was in the room. Um, everyone learns a lot from this, and over time, you figure out ways to set up the rooms um, in ways that are a little bit more helpful. So in this code, I initially never would have thought to put the documenter here. Of course, this was really challenging because it was a double room. This is a, an immobile wall that's in between these two patients, so everyone sort of crammed over here. I never would have thought to put the documenter here, but the documenter actually said that this worked quite well because she could hear what the NPs um, who was giving medications um, and, the, um, and she could have like a direct line of sight with the leader. Uh, so I never would have thought that that was a good place to be, but she actually really uh, liked that. Uh, we talked later that um, there was some sort of dead space. We could have gotten this supply cart out. Um, maybe we didn't need um, all three NPs and a resident and an attending and a fellow and another fellow and another resident. Um, we often find that the we don't have enough nurses in our codes and we have way too many other providers. So showing this to people can be really helpful uh, for the next code for them to think about where to set people up in the room. Um, so we talked about this for a while in this code that um, with more than 20 people at the bedside in a really small room, it impeded the team's ability to get stuff done quickly. Um, and then of course we talk about the CPR quality. So for this code, we had entitled data, we had CPR quality monitoring data from the defibrillator, and we had the CPR quality coach um, that was available. Um, sometimes we're able to put NEARS or um, near infrared spectrometry on uh, the head to see if we're getting cerebral blood flow. Sometimes we'll have an arterial line or a central venous pressure that we can review. We didn't have those for these. So we'll sort of pull up. This is the um, data that comes out of our defibrillator. And you can see that this is the sort of um, line where the chest compression rate goal is between 100 and 120. And we can see that we were actually pretty fast for a lot of this code. Um, and we'll talk about reasons that we may have been fast um, and the importance of um, chest compression rate uh, during CPR. We'll also talk about the depth. So our goal depth for this patient was two centimeters, um, which we didn't meet most of this arrest. Uh, so we'll talk about ways to improve depth, like using a step stool, uh, why this is important. Um, this is the same data, looked in a different uh, screenshot. And then we'll look at and we'll do overall. So overall, we had great chest compression fraction during this. It was 95% of the time we were doing, um, or sorry, 85% of the time we were doing chest compressions. Actually, I think that should be 95%. Um, and, but we didn't have great chest compression depth um, 
and about 60% of the time our rate was good. So the other issue with our debt that we figured out during this code review is that actually the pads were placed anterior or anterior. So we, we were able to uh, spend some time talking about pad placement and how important that is. Um, we'll sometimes zoom in to look at pauses um, in chest compression. So this was a uh, about 12 second pause um, for needle decompression. We'll talk about did it need to be that long? Um, it was probably appropriate. Um, so I always have a summary slide at the end is what went well. So we, for this patient, we actually got return of spontaneous circulation and she was back to her neurologic baseline within hours. Uh, the team at the bedside, I don't think we talked about this, but did a really fast trait change. And it was sort of within our, with our institution an ideal scenario. So the fellow led the code, the attending was able to help, um, the information was flowing in the right ways and the leadership was clear. Um, there was a conversation early on about ECMO um, and uh, we were able to also communicate with the attending on service um, quickly to find out if there was anything that we were missing. And then we spent some time talking about uh, areas for improvement. So what should everyone take away from this code review that we need to do better the next time? Um, so pad placement. So AP pad placement is really important in, um, to get good data and to get good feedback. Um, once the patient had returned to spontaneous circulation, we had a really hard time getting her back into the ICU um, because of equipment issues. So we were able to talk about our nursing leadership about um, the construction site um, that was sort of set up and we were able to widen that so it didn't happen again. Um, and everybody, this is in the middle of the night and all 30 providers in the ICU were in the code and the other 80 patients in our ICU weren't um, necessarily being attended to at that time. So we talked about um, really sending people away to, to deal with the rest of the patients while the people can focus on the code. Um, and oftentimes we'll find things that were documented wrong on the code sheet, so we often go over that. And then we'll pick out a few educational points. So during this arrest, we talked about the um, in-title monitoring during CPR, um, what is the data behind its use. Um, other topics that we frequently talk about are things like baseline CPR quality, um, CPR mechanics, the importance of chest compression depth, rate, fraction, the science behind that. Um, what are other physiologic monitoring that we can use, like arterial lines? Uh, some, some of our debriefings, if the patient has ROSC, will focus a lot on post-cardiac arrest care, um, treatment of arrhythmias, cardiac arrest um, in pulmonary hemorrhage, and the, some really, we've had some really interesting debriefings where our trauma team has come and really talked about trauma-related cardiac arrest management and how that's different than the rest of our arrests. Um, and then we've always finished with a patient update. Um, so how do you get started? If you think that this is, you know, something that may be helpful, I would say the first thing that you need outside of sort of support from your division and hospital is data. Um, there is evidence exists that now, and hopefully more that's coming, that these projects really do improve um, patient care and patient outcomes. Um, getting an MOC program started might improve your physician um, buy-in. Um, and, um, you know, finding someone who understands how to use the data to like walk you through that the first time, whether or not it's your representative who maybe understands how to get the data out of your machines or someone else who has, um, more, more experience using them. Um, I would say incorporate trainees. This is a great learning experience for trainees. Um, it gets them involved in quality improvement, which is really fantastic, and really create a small group um, that owns this together. So a program based on one person will almost always fail. Um, people take vacations, people are in clinical time, um, things happen in life where you may need to be away for six months, and if you're relying on one person to run a program like this, their program will immediately fall apart. So we have a, a core of probably three or four attendings who help run these meetings, even though they only happen once a month, um, sometimes that's not enough. Um, and then a really great group of nurses and respiratory therapists who help us run these meetings too. So um, that can be really, uh, really helpful to have a, a group working on this. Um, and with that, I say thanks for listening. Um, everyone seemed to have stuck around to the end, which I'm really excited about. And I think we have um, a good amount of time for questions if anyone has any.
So the first question was, what is the name of the researcher who studies psychological safety? Uh, her name is Amy Edmondson. Oh, there's another one. Um, E-D-M-O-N-D-S-O-N. -O -O um, and she wrote a recent book. Uh, she's written a book called Teaming. She's written a few books and they're all really good. Um, let me see if I can find on my uh, library. Yeah, Teaming is her most recent book. It's, uh, I would recommend everyone see it. The Fearless Organization is another one that she's written. Um, so the next question is what, defibrill what defibrillators manufacturer or model are you using and with what feedback pads? Uh, so that's a great question. So right now we, um, are using the Zoll R series. Um, and because we are a pediatric institution, we have three different sets of pads um, because of the various size of our patients. Um, I don't have the exact pads on me, but uh, we use the PD pads and then the adult AP pads. Um, and I can find that information. Um, and send it to you later. Okay, here we go. Four questions from one person, that's fantastic. Uh, how do you document during codes EMR, EMR or pencil and paper? Uh, right now we are doing pencil and paper documentation uh, we have found it to be fairly unreliable, and we are in the process of switching to EMR documentation within the next month or two, uh, so I can let you know how that goes. <laughs> um, and then do you do the room diagram during the hot debrief? Uh, we don't tend to um, do the room diagram during our hot debriefings, uh, but we will sometimes, if, if there was an issue with the flow of the room, talk about that, and we'll use that information to create the room diagram for the cold debriefings. And then um, the next question was, what role is the CPR quality coach and do they have a patient assignment during the day? Um, so right now we have a fairly informal CPR quality coach program um, where uh, either our fellows or our senior nurses who are familiar, um, very familiar with the defibrillators will take on that role. Um, they, do tend to have a patient assignment during the day, or it might be our charge nurse. Um, oftentimes the um, CPR quality coach is um, one of our fellows. So we are you know, lucky enough or, um, to have a really big unit. So we have you know, um, 90 patients um, probably on our floor, or at least that's the maximum. So we tend to have two or three fellows, two or three nurse practitioners around during the day. So if the fellow that's not running the code also can take, or one of the nurse practitioners will take over that CPR quality coach role. Um, but there's certainly a lot of room to organize that a lot more, I think. And then uh, a follow-up question from before. Um, it's what suite or software application do you use for data collection and extraction? Um, so I've done everything from very simple, um, uh, in the past with our Philips monitors, just sort of look at the, um, pre-arrest information where we can see the respiratory plus and the pulse ox. Uh, in the beginning, honestly, we just went to the bedside after an arrest and we would print them <laughs> and then we would um, this was a very manual process. Then we would fax, we, we would scan them into the computer and then look at all of the pages one by one. Um, now we have a system, and I'm blanking on the name of it, um, where we can do this more electronically now and then just take screenshots. And then we use PowerPoint to present all of our pres presentations. And then uh, for Zoll, they have, um, a web-based platform and then also um, a software program that will um, 
code review and case review. Um, either of them are great to use and it will get you all of your data in a display format um, for debriefing. And then another question is, um, do you use pads that provide real-time CPR feedback? If so, during debriefing, do you incorporate review and how to interpret and act on real-time feedback to improve CPR quality in the moment? Um, so, yes, we do use pads that provide uh, real-time CPR feedback. Um, during debriefing, and so then the next question is sort of during debriefing, do you incorporate review of how to interpret and act on that feedback? Um, so yes, I would say that um, we do a few things to sort of improve how we use CPR feedback. One of the things that we do and we've done for a while are they're called rolling refreshers, um, which means that we'll take the sort of highest risk patients in our unit that are we think might have an arrest. Um, Maybe they're being cannulated on ECMO that day, or um, you know, they're in renal failure and their potassium is eight and they're going on CRRT. Um, for those patients, we will, one of our charge nurses will take actually the defibrillator to the bedside and run the nurse, the nurses on either side of them and the respiratory therapist through a quick 30 second um, CPR and defibrillator refresher so that all of that information is really fresh in their head. So that's one way we're able to, and then um, with that refresher, we look at the feedback on the um, defibrillator so that people know what the different feedbacks are. Um, I think over time, as we just have focused on this, it's, it's become something that people have um, mastered, um, at least our senior people in our unit have mastered pretty well. How's your program funded? Um, that's a good question also. So we actually don't have any formal funding um, to do any of this. The, um, the rolling refreshers are done by one of the charge nurses during the day. Um, and that's just part of their role. Um, I, uh, while I don't have formal funding to do the debriefings and coordinate those, um, my boss is certainly uh, thinks it's useful, so he gives me time to do that from an academic time standpoint. Um, but this, and you know, much QI is is done um, unfortunately without a lot of extra funding. And then a very helpful colleague, thank you, Carly, um, sent me a dead text message saying that um, we use Bedmaster, which is exactly what it's called um, to get our the data from our Phelps monitors um, into a usable format to screenshot. Uh, okay, next question. Are hospital CPR quality is objectively poor to the point where many clinicians don't believe it's accurate? How might you suggest we overcome this? Um, so that's a really good point. And I'll have to say that um, we uh, believe the feedback um, in our institution, um, although we struggle because with our smaller children, especially the sort of one year to five year range, we are frequently finding that um, we feel like we're compressing to adequate um, depth when you look at the depth of the chest, or if we have an art line in at the same time, we're able to see that we're getting good pressure, blood pressures of 90 over 60 with the chest compressions we're doing, but we're not necessarily compressing that deep if you actually look at the depth. Um, so I think there's a, a few things um, uh, that, you, that we have done. So I think there are some things that are very reliable. So the chest compression rate um, in the defibrillators is, is quite reliable. Um, the depth is also so i think one it's making sure everyone is putting the pads on correctly because if the pads aren't on exactly ap sometimes you won't um, get as good of feedback and measurements um, so improving that might help 
I think just also showing people over and over and over, and especially if you do have um, an event where actually the CPR quality was really good for a period of time, um, people are sort of willing to believe good things, but not always the bad things. So if you can at least get them bought into the fact that um, some of the CPR quality is good, which means that sometimes it's not good, um, that they also will improve. Um, but that's that's a really hard one and it really just has to do with buy-in and i think over time if you just keep showing them and showing them and showing them um uh, people hopefully will get on board uh, next question was do you have a template you use for the case reviews um yep so we have um a slide deck of about five or six slides that has the sort of introduction slides and then it sort of just sort of lays out the for our fellows that like now you'll put in the um, history information this is where you talk about the beginning of the rest this is where you show the CPR data um, so we have that the other thing that is um, helpful and we can make available is um, one of my colleagues Carly Zieber actually wrote up our initial uh, work with um, creating uh, the debriefing program that walks through um, all the parts of the debriefing program as well as the um, clinical um, points that we work and that is published um, a while back now but we can get the information for that also uh, so the next question is can you please explain how you're using saturations in relation to CPR quality um, so I think that um, it's an interesting question and we're doing some new studies that I think will, well, I'm not doing them. Some of my colleagues at CHOP are doing some studies to sort of look at the relationship between um, the pulse ox tracing and CPR quality and whether or not it can be predictive. Uh, we don't have that data right now. And, um, but when do we use pulse ox tracings? I think that um, we always use the highest quality data we have available. So if I have an arterial line tracing, I'm probably gonna look to that first to see if we're getting good blood pressures. Um, if I have an art line in and we're not getting good blood pressures, then I'm gonna look to my depth and my rate and make sure that my mechanics are good. Um, if I don't have any of that, so say that we're in the, um, we're in the unit and the patient doesn't have an art line and we don't have the CPR defibrillator pads on yet, then I'll use anything I have. So I will look up at the monitor and there's two things that can be helpful that I found is that the respiratory plus um, screen tends to actually be a pretty good um, reflection of the chest compression rate for us. So if the respiratory plus says you're going 100 times a minute, that's probably your chest compression rate, which can be helpful. And then um, what we'll say is that if, you, if you've gotten a pulse ox tracing back, then you're probably doing a pretty good job, but you can't really say that um, if it's there or not that, you, that you're actually um, you know, hitting um, targets. But I think there will be some more interesting information in the next few years coming out about that. Um, so the next question is, who leads the hot debriefs? Um, is it a rapid response nurse? Uh, do you have a dedicated physician as the lead for the reviews? So for hot debriefs, um, right now it tends to actually be the physician who ran the code um, because they tend to be the most comfortable of the whole team. Um, I would actually love to get away from that person being the person that runs the debriefing because I think uh, the person running the code has a sort of a single view of what happened and um, they would probably benefit more from being as part of the debriefing rather than running it. Uh, but right now, uh, we're in the process of creating a training program, um, but it's going to take us probably another year to get it actually rolled out. And then our goal would have be uh, one of our senior nurses, whether or not it's um, the charge nurse for that team or the leadership nurse who's on for the unit at the time. And then the next question is, do you have a dedicated physician as the lead for the reviews? So for the cold debriefing program, we do. Um, I'm the physician who um, facilitates all of the events. And then we have a fellow. So our fellowship sort of works that um, all of the fellows have an administrative role. Um, and one of the fellows administrative roles is the cardiac arrest debriefings that happen. 
Um, so, and then that person works with other fellows to sort of create the, the reviews um, and the learning points from each event. Um, and we actually have a sort of a small group um, that does that. Um, the next question is, can you speak a little more about CPR coaches? Do you address the psychological impact of these events with staff during, um, at all during your debriefs? Um, so CPR coaches is um, an idea that's been around for a while. Um, really the, sort of one of the pioneers in CPR coaching is Betsy Hunt at Hopkins, um, at Johns Hopkins. And um, they just published a great paper, uh, I think in the Journal of the American Heart Association, looking at a randomized controlled trial in a simulation setting, looking at the impact of CPR coaches on CPR quality. Uh, and the teams that had a dedicated CPR coach, so someone whose role during the code is to um, look at the uh, defibrillator and communicate with the chest compressors um, what they need to be doing differently. Some people can look at the feedback but not process it. Some people are sort of auditory processors, so they need to hear someone say push faster, push deeper. Um, some people do better seeing, so everyone's a little different. Um, and I think there are, is going to be a study, hopefully, of looking at CPR coaches in real life to see if they improve quality of CPR during actual um, cardiac arrest. So I think it can be a good role um, if you have extra people, uh, which we frequently do. So give someone a job. Um, the next question is, do you address the psychological impact of these events with staff at all during your debriefs? Um, so I think Psycholo the psychological impact naturally comes up a lot during our hot debriefings. Um, and what we have put in place is that we have sort of, I think what every hospital has, which is some um, counseling resources that we um, make available to everyone as a part of their job. Um, we don't expect our debriefers or any of our staff to be able to, um, you know, take on that role. But I think what we will say is, what I will say is that, you know, especially for myself, um, and especially, I think this is probably true in pediatrics and a lot of adult hospitals, is that um, sometimes patients arrest that you have long-standing relationships with. Um, kids that have been in the unit for a long time or adults that have been, um, that you've taken care of, you know, over the years. Um, and those can be really hard for people. Um, and even just saying that this is really hard, um, I think can help the group. There's been some interesting research looking at whether or not debriefing actually uh, can either improve or worsen PTSD after arrest. Um, that there's not great science either way. And I think the most recent study that just came out in resuscitation sort of implies that um, the people who walk away from an event that are sort of the most uh, high score highest on the PDS, PTSD scales tend to be the least um, experienced in the room. So new residents, young nurses, people who haven't been around these events as much um, and are more likely to internalize and sort of take blame for things that happened. Um, so I think that sort of just setting the stage and saying that these are, are hard events and they're hard on everyone, even if you've done this a hundred times, um, but we don't take on the role of trying to sort of certainly counsel anyone through the issues they're having. Oh, someone's asking me to go back to the entitled CO2 slide. Um, I sort of skipped over it. Oops, let's see if I can. Um, yes, and I think the uh, I will double check, but I do think the slide deck will be available. Uh, I'm trying to go backwards. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so um, this is this uh, one of the slides I've put together in the past about entitled CO2 as being a surrogate for cardiac output um, in the absence of a, in a patient who doesn't have significant lung disease um, entitled does directly affect the amount of pulmonary blood flow and can be used as a uh, marker for cardiac output. 
Um, so changes in CPR quality that improve or worsen cardiac input can accordingly affect entitle. And there's um, a fair amount of, um, there's believers in entitle and there's disbelievers in entitle, but there's a, a good amount of information out there. So part of what we do in these debriefings is just bring that information back to the team. Uh, okay, and I think this will probably be the last question we do, but um, do you have any recommendations for those of us who may not have the defibrillators to pull depth and or data? Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think that if um, you have central monitor data and are able to, to look at that, you can, um, even just from the respiratory plus, you can sort of look at what was your chest compression rate or what were your pauses. Um, I think even talking to people about what went well and what didn't go well um, can be very helpful, um, as well as sort of reviewing your code sheets for sort of things that are glaringly errors about, um, you know, it it's always surprises me every time I look at a code sheet um, for how much, how many errors there are written down on a code sheet and whether or not that's because the error actually happened or just the wrong thing was written down. Um, and then I would say that if you don't have the defibrillators um, that pull depth or data, then, um, you know, I know it's a, a dream world sometimes that we live in, but really going back to your administrators, I, I think that the American Heart Association in their most recent recommendations recommends um, using a defibrillator that gives you um, uh, uh, feedback. Um, and there's a lot of science about using these defibrillators to improve quality. So I think it, um, they can be very helpful. Do you have time for eight more questions? Sure. Let's see, do you do these reviews only for the PICU or do you review codes that occurred outside of the ICU? Um, so I will say that we routinely do these in our pediatric ICU. Um, our neonatal ICU has started to do code reviews in the last two years. And um, we try to do debriefings um, for codes that occur outside of the ICU when we're able. Um, so we will go to a flex. So if, if we had a, a code recently that was actually an employee, um, which was really hard for people who worked in that unit, we were able to go back a few days later um, review the CPR, the CPR data, uh, the events that led up to the code and sort of just let people talk. Um, I will have to say that when we review codes outside of the ICU, there tends to be more people that are younger and haven't been exposed to codes. So if we are going to do that, I'll make sure that we have a social worker or someone from our um, sort of grief counseling team within the hospital that comes with us because they can be um, just a little bit more emotional than the ones that happen within the PICU for people who are relatively more used to seeing them. Uh, the next question is, in a hot debrief, who leads the debriefing? When everyone is rushing the patient to the ICU and the team disperses, how do you run the hot debriefs? How soon after a code? Um, so I, I think that this is really challenging and I, and I actually don't want everyone to think that we have this perfect hot debriefing program in our PICU. Um, we have a really solid cold debriefing program because we can plan for it. I think hot debriefs probably only happen in our unit 20 to 30% of the time. Um, so when it does happen, it tends to be led by one of our physicians because we haven't gotten people trained well enough to run these debriefings yet. Um, when we are able to have them, what we try to do is um, pick a time um, before the end of the shift. So we find that like 6.15 in the morning tends to be a pretty good time because most, um, as long as that's not when the event happened, um, it tends to be a slower time for our unit before um, change of shift. Um, so we'll try to get together for 15 minutes to talk about it. I think um, the other key thing um, about hot debriefs is just, if you're trying to start a hot debrief program, making sure that the the goal is to keep them fast. I think when we look at our numbers, ours only tend to last 10 to 15 minutes. I think if they draw out and they run on too long, then you'll get people um, sort of turned off to them. Um, so I say a hot debrief is anytime within the shift. 
And then do you have a code map or role checklist? Um, so we don't. We have tried to do this in multiple different ways with slap bands and stickers. Um, and we just find that people show up. So if anyone on the webinar has figured out how to solve this, I would be really happy to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Um, next question, how do you come to an understanding with the legal department and accessing the data from the defibrillator? They have been the ones who have been a barrier for us in the past. Um, isn't that so interesting that you have all of this data that um, can be helpful for patients and the, the legal department doesn't want you to look at it? Um, so I think a few things. One, knowing that um, I, I think perhaps if you go back to them and discuss that the goal of looking at this data is in a quality improvement um, setting, um, similar to an ACA or an RCA, um, and that if you can set up a way in which to do this where you either delete the data in a certain amount of time or um, come up with some sort of policy, um, you should be able to, I would hope, work through that. I find that most of the times for most institutions, um, their data is, can be improved, but is pretty good. Um, and we, we don't, haven't had a problem in a while with this. Um, next question is how are the physicians who are not involved in the team responding to the feedback from their review? Um, so that's an interesting question also. Um, we get really good feedback from all of the physicians and nurses and respiratory therapists who come to our reviews. Um, and it's something that we should follow up in the paper that I mentioned that, um, Carly Zuber wrote when we first started this program, um, it looked at sort of what our team thought about the reviews. Um, and uh, they are very well received because the goal is to improve and the goal isn't just, is, it's not a negative experience for people. So I think as when you're looking to sort of um, build these programs, making sure that they are happening in a way in which people feel safe um, can be really important. Uh, next question is great information on psychological safety. Uh, how did you create this culture for a safe environment and how do you sustain the safe and culture external to the cold debrief session? Um, so that's a really great question. Um, so how did you create this culture for a safe environment? I think that, um, so. I didn't start this program. I took it over when I was a um, second year fellow from one of um, my senior fellows who had started it uh, the year or two beforehand. So I think that the, the work that they did on creating psychological safety um, was sort of twofold. One, I think we were starting with a fairly good baseline within our um, institution, well, within our unit for sure. Um, and sort of the slides that I showed in the beginning is what they had sort of come together with, sort of really setting the um, baseline for what is expected behavior in the sessions. Um, and then also as the moderator, when things start going outside of the boundaries, really quickly pulling the team back in and refocusing on improvement um, and not blame. I, I can't say that I have to do that very much anymore, um, but in the beginning, I think people had to sort of be um, coached uh, and how to sort of behave in these events. Um, and then the question about how do you sustain the safe culture external to the cold debriefing session? Um, I think that is, it's such, it's such an important question and I don't know that we have uh, mastered that. I think that it starts with leadership, um, modeling that behavior and um, creating a supportive environment. And I think that the books um, that I had recommended by Amy Edmondson would be a really great um, place to go for sort of how to um, change the culture in an entire institution, because that's what her focus really is. Um, one more question is, with my shop, it's difficult to get the participants back together for a cold debrief. So I interview the participants and put together very similar info and format and email it to staff that respond to codes. I think that is great. Um, I think the goal of um, the debriefing sessions is really to get data back to people. 
Um, and, you know, what I would be interested in asking you is if, um, you know, how you deal with, you know, what to improve in the future. And maybe those are just some, some points. I find that in our code reviews, when we're talking in the group, we tend to do some group think and um, problem solving, which can be really helpful. Um, but certainly the, the sort of follow up emails to the people who weren't um, able to be there can be really, very helpful. Um, sounds great. And I think that there's a, a lot more questions um, and I'm so excited that everyone's still here. I think we're going to collate a list of all the questions and then um, be able to send them out separately because um, I think we have to wrap up the webinar now. <laughs> yes, thank you, Heather. Sorry about that. We have loads and loads of questions, but I assure everybody that I'll collect the remaining questions that had not been asked and um, we have your email address and um, Heather you can uh, we'll be able to answer them individually um, so thank you so much for the participation the questions um, and thank you so much dr. Wolf for your wonderful insights and such an informative presentation I found it very intriguing